Funding provided by the Connecticut Democracy Center, the Governor M. Jody Rell Center for Public Service at the University of Hartford, Travelers, and Yukon Health. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ray Hardman, arts and culture reporter for Connecticut Public. Welcome to tonight's first congressional district debate, live from the SBM Charitable Foundation Auditorium on the campus of Manchester Community College. Tonight's debate is a collaboration between the League of Women Voters of Connecticut and Connecticut Public. Before I introduce the candidates, let me first go through the cumulative time format. The format is designed to allow the candidates time to discuss the issues. The only rule is that the total time used by each candidate by the conclusion of the debate be, must be approximately the same. The candidates will not be restricted to one or two minute responses. Instead, they may spend as little or as much time as they feel is appropriate to discuss each issue. Our goal is to encourage debate. The candidates will take turns being the first to respond to a question. At the conclusion of the question period of this debate, each candidate will make a two-minute closing statement. Members of the League of Women Voters are serving as timers for the debates and will keep us informed of the time expended. If a serious imbalance in time used occurs during the course of the debate, I will call it to their attention. Applause is permitted at the start and at the end of tonight's program. And now, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage Democratic nominee John Larson. and Republican nominee, Dr. Larry Laser. The first question was chosen by a coin flip, and it goes to Mr. Larson. Uh, Mr. Larson, this is a question from Joan in Bloomfield. Do you support federal legislation that would overturn Connecticut's laws regarding women's access to reproductive health care, including abortion? Well, thank you for that question, Ray, and uh, thank the League of Women Voters and also uh, PBS for their uh, support of this debate. As Senate President in the state of Connecticut back in 1990, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, join with my colleagues a young man named George Jepson, who became Attorney General of the state of Connecticut, and another young man named Richard Blumenthal, who was in the Senate at the time. We became the first state in the nation to codify Roe versus Wade. And it is my focus today, when you have two daughters, when you see what women have gone through, and to see this court decision wreak havoc on people's lives, and could, could, to criminalize motherhood, to me, is so wrong-headed uh, that uh, we will fight as we have in the House of Representatives and continue to pass women's reproductive rights and send them on to the Senate. And Mitch McConnell can do everything he wants to try to block it, but the American people are going to speak and speak loud and clear. I will always protect women's reproductive rights. I commend my opponent, too, who wrote a very thoughtful article in the Hartford Current. And these are the kind of decisions that should be left up to doctors and nurse practitioners, but most importantly to the women who are involved and who have to go through the ordeal of pregnancy. This is something that um, I feel very strongly about and something that we will continue to pursue. Mm -hmm. Dr. Laser. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, Connecticut Public Television, and Ray for putting this event on. These debates are critical to learn about John, learn about myself, 
And so I, I welcome this opportunity. I'm an OBGYN physician. Uh, I've been that since 1990. I've been an advocate for women's health since that time. I think I could be a good influence on, in Congress talking about this issue. I've met with women one-on-one -on -one in very difficult situations talking about their decisions. As John alluded to, I wrote an op-ed in the Hartford Current. I'm a Republican who's pro-choice. I think what we need is we need a congressional law that comes out and says women have choice. Uh, I think, speaking from my experience, I can probably have a, a big influence on that, on that bill, and I'm a strong advocate for that. Let me just take a moment, though, talking about this debate. These debates are critical, if people are going to hear what we have to say. And tonight, we each have a half an hour to talk. And I just want to say to Congressman Larson, we heard about how important debates are in, in politics. Why don't we do more debates? Tonight, I have a half an hour, you have a half an hour. I think at a, a time where government has lost confidence in the American people, we have 12% of Americans who have faith in Congress, we have people concerned about democracy. John, we should do more debates, because people want to hear your thoughts, my thoughts, talk about the economy, talk about inner cities, talk about health care, talk about women's rights. But I think we need to get that out of the way, that if we're going to have a debate, and we heard in the beginning how important these debates are, 30 minutes each is probably not enough. And so I would ask Congressman Larson, you have the ability to do more debates. Would you be willing to do more debates? Larry, thank you uh, for that. And I would uh, clearly like to do more debates in terms of uh, making the record clear. And I believe uh, we have several appearances that are scheduled. And I'd like to start with Social Security and uh, we're visiting 30 senior centers around the 1st Congressional District. I welcome you to join me at any of those and debate Social Security, because in Washington, D.C., not a single Republican has signed on to our proposal on Social Security. And as much as I appreciate your stance as well and what you wrote in the Hartford Current, uh, the Republicans in this Congress are extreme, and they are proposing a total ban on abortion. They are opposing a ban, they are opposing to end contraceptives and go after gay marriage as well. That is not the kind of America that anyone in this audience or the state of Connecticut, or I dare say the country wants. And so I'm more than happy to do that. And you're welcome to join us anywhere. You're welcome to join us at the Disability Forum tomorrow. You're welcome to join us later on this week. I know we have a couple of other scheduled appearances. I'm more than happy to debate any time on any issue. So that's, that's not a debate, John. That's a forum to talk about Social Security, which I'm more than happy to talk about Social Security. You know, we need a solution for Social Security. And you have, a, you have a proposal, and people can go on my website and look at the proposal and look at the reviews of that. There's a problem with your proposal. There's never been a benefit package for Social Security that's been temporary. Your proposal has benefits that increase for five years. That's never happened in Social Security, in the history of Social Security. And it's very difficult for seniors to plan when benefits are only for five years. What happens at the end of five years? Right now, they plan to go back down. Now, John, if they don't go back down, your plan makes the Social Security in a worse fiscal situation than it is now. And so I, I would have people, you could Google Social Security 2100 and look at the Centers for Budget and Policy Priorities, and it'll pop up on your phone and look at that, because John's proposing, and this is kind of what John does all the time. John constantly proposes spending. And I'm all for government reaching out and helping people in need. The problem is John is always spending more than what you need to do. And those benefits are not covered by the increased taxation you talk about. And there's a price for that. And that price is inflation. That price is higher taxes. That price is debt. Never before have we seen so much debt. So I think one of the biggest things that will distinguish John Larson and Larry Laser is the amount of spending. And I think families and small business get hit with that. And we need to push back. So the answer on the debates, John, is yes or no. We're going to do more debates. 
Larry, Larry uh, thank you for uh, your re response. Let me just say a couple of things. First and foremost, those are good talking points uh, that you raise, but they're, they're not a plan and they're not a program. Tell the five million seniors that get below poverty level checks from the government in the wealthiest nation in the world that uh, we're spending too much. Tell the individuals who have to continue to work after they retire and find that while they're working, they're getting taxed on their Social Security. Tell people who have been waiting for more than 51 years for Congress to extend benefits. You're right, I'm not just about protecting Social Security. I'm about expanding the benefits because it hasn't been done. It hasn't been done in 51 years. And not only that, Larry, 10,000 baby boomers become eligible for Social Security every single day. This is a need that Congress can no longer neglect. Martin Luther King called it the fierce urgency of now. And you talk about inflation. What group is impacted more by inflation than seniors in this country? They've been impacted the most by the pandemic. Of the million plus people who have perished, over 756,000 are over the age of 65. And who are the people impacted by inflation? They're seniors, the people that are on fixed income. And that's why they need a benefit increase. And that's why they need it now. And the statistics that you cite, there are over 350 groups who have supported Social Security 2100, a sacred trust. And the reason they do so is because we also recognize that for so long, teachers, firefighters, police officers have gone without and have been penalized under this system. They need to be able to receive a benefit that they can depend on. So many Americans find that Social Security is exactly for them the only benefit that they have. And so we have to make sure that it's there for them. Gentlemen, I'm gonna stop you right there. Uh, Dr. Laser, I'm gonna let you respond, but we've gone a little bit far afield from the original question, which was a whim's right to choose. So I'm gonna let you respond and then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, so John, I'm not talking about getting rid of Social Security, so you're throwing a curveball to people right there. I have a, a mother-in-law here who accepts Social Security. I have a father who's 91 who accepts Social Security. The problem is, John, you're spending way too much money and you're making it worse off fiscally. What people say is if you're gonna make benefit increases, make them permanent. You cannot have increases that are temporary. Secondly, if you're gonna fix Social Security, make it fiscally sound. Your plan is not fiscally sound, and I welcome. We'll have on our website a review on Social Security. I'm happy to debate you about Social Security. Not only, and, not and only. I think we, uh, John, I think it's my time. I'm happy to debate you on Social Security, but let's talk facts. Let's not use seniors and, and scare them and scare tactics. I believe in Social Security. I believe it should be, there should be some benefits, but let's have a plan that works. People can go to the Center of Budget and Policy and look at your plan right now. Either it's going to decrease benefits after five years. It's going to run out of money, John, in how many years? Four more years, it runs out of money. So those are facts, John. I, I, I'll talk those are facts. Not facts. You, John, you're throwing a curveball. People need to know the facts about Social Security. I totally believe Social Security is needed and we need to have some benefits. I think people need to do their own reading and figure out what's right. They are not, they, they, these are the facts. These are the facts, Larry. And what Larry's saying is that people, he doesn't want Congress to have to vote. The Social Security Plan 2100 is paid in full, Larry. And you know what it requires no, it Congress not, to vote? No, it Something, is not. yes it is. No, it's not. It's paid in full. All the benefits the are benefits paid for. With the benefits after five years? Provided that Congress doesn't act. And Does what does Congress have to do to do that, Larry? That would mean that Congress would actually have to vote. Unlike in the Senate, 
where Mitch McConnell has blocked over 546 of the bills that were passed in the House of Representatives. John, you're, you're throwing curveballs. Let's talk about Social Security, Sir, I think this and is we my will do time. that. Gentlemen, Go ahead. we're going to move on. We yep. do have a question about Social Security a little bit later. Far, we from, can certainly... far, from, uh, far from a curveball. I think he's thrown a couple of sliders over there. I know the Yankees okay. are playing tonight. But, okay. uh, Dr. Larson, uh, Dr. Laser, this question is for you. Yep. And you touched on it a little bit. Inflation is a concern of many voters this election cycle. If elected, what would you do on the federal level to fight it? Inflation is a huge concern. And as we all know, it affects the lowest socioeconomic groups more than anyone, and seniors. And even Democratic economists, look at Larry Summers, president of Harvard University, and Bill Clinton's treasury secretary, Barack Obama's top economic advisor. Look at Steve Ratner. Look at David Brooks, who writes about it in the New York Times. Overspending has been a big cause of inflation. David Brooks would say 2 to 4 percent, most economists would say. We don't have anyone who spends more than John Larson. No one spends more. Look at his loan forgiveness. Biden proposes $10,000. John proposes $50,000. Where is that money coming from? Do we want seniors and blue-collar workers and people go to community college to pay for that? We need to get control of spending. Since John took office in 1998, Google the debt. Google the spending. Because he feels the more he spends, the more you'll like him. Sometimes, as a leader, you have to control costs. That doesn't mean you stop Social Security. It even means you can benefit Social Security. But let's talk facts. Inflation needs to be addressed. And unfortunately, what needs to happen now, as rates go up, we see that if you want a mortgage a year ago, it was 3%. Now it's 7%. Look at the difference in terms of what you can borrow with that. In, in Connecticut, we have tough situations for small business. I had a press conference for small business. When you look at high taxes, high overhead, high cost of labor, and then you throw in the biggest headwind for inflation, for the biggest headwind for small business is inflation. So what you have to do is you have to ask your leaders to get responsible about spending. I believe in spending, but John, between Social Security that doesn't add up, between loan forgiveness that doesn't add up, between tunneling our highways that doesn't add up, John is a spender. And we need to get away from that. We need to be honest with the voters, and they can read about Social Security and see who's telling the truth about that. We are honest with the voters. And uh, again, the Republicans have a lot of platitudes, and I guess you're falling right in line with them there, Dr. Larry. And uh, you know they say that it's uh, inf inflation, and clearly, people are impacted and people are hurting and they're frightened during this time of inflation. You haven't heard one single proposal from any Republican to deal with inflation. Social Security deals directly with people who need this money and need it now. That's dealing with people who are impacted the most on inflation. I'm proud of what we've been able to do in this session. First, the American Rescue Plan, where we put vaccinations in people's arms, kids back in their school seats, people back to work, and money in their wallets. Now, no Republican voted for it, but they're the vote no and take the dough. They sent letters out to everybody asking if they got their stimulus check. We passed a historic, historic infrastructure bill that was needed. All the Republican governors who got the money and lobbied for that, Larry, you know what? None of them have called and asked it back ask for it back. And in the American Rescue Plan, every single town in this district received money from the federal government to go locally for their education systems, to go into their communities directly, and also to make sure that there were monies there for police and firefighting and all the essentials that we need. $567 million. You call that wasteful spending? I call that direct relief for people during a pandemic mm -hmm. who needed it. And then most of all, the Inflation Reduction Act to deal with climate change for the first time, to make sure that the United States again is a leader in this area, to make sure that future generations will have cleaner air, cleaner water, and also deal with energy costs that are rising. We have a specific plan. 
We've taken action on these plants. And you know what we were able to do in the process, Larry? We were able to reduce and cut the deficit by a trillion dollars. <laughs> and then in the American, and then in the Inflation Reduction Act, an additional $350 billion cut as well. So don't tell me about spending. Give me your plan and what you're going to do for people. You can give all the platitudes you want, but if you don't have a plan, then it's not worth much. John, you didn't decrease the deficit. When we went through the pandemic, and thank you, I was giving vaccines and in the hospital caring for people, we had a deficit of $2.7 trillion. So the Democrats have this idea that says, okay, we had this brutal year in 2020 where we lost $2.7 <coughs> trillion. Now we're losing a trillion dollars a year. So therefore, we have another $1.7 to spend because we didn't lose as much as 2020. That's not good government, John, okay? You want to decrease inflation, decrease spending? Decrease your college loan forgiveness. That goes to the wealthiest Americans in the future income. You, you're proposing $50,000 per student. I don't know why that's funny, John, but you're proposing $50,000 per student. Where's that money coming from, okay? You look at the amount of spending you have and you say, how are we gonna pay for it? And John has this great thing of going around to towns and saying, I'm giving $20 million to Manchester or Wethersfield. Great. You know what he should do? We call him a bad Santa. Because John, you don't tell people when you give them the money, you're raising the debt, you're raising the taxes, you're raising inflation. Even democratic economists are saying that. You need to be honest with people. If you're gonna give the money, say what's the cost of that? There's not an endless supply of money. John tends to think that there is, and we all end up paying the price, particularly the poorest people who are left with going to the grocery store. Do you know how much more money you have to pay this year compared to last year because of excessive spending? Go to the grocery store, go to the gas station, pay your utilities. A family of four, John, is paying $6,000 more this year for buying exactly the same products they bought last year. Thank you very much, okay? So when you give out money, tell people that our debt now is $31 trillion. If you divide that by 100 million families in America, that's 300,000 per family. That doesn't count state debt or town debt. John, you are a massive, massive spender. And I think if we're gonna draw a distinction between John Larson and Larry Laser, spending would be one area I would go. But you wanna talk about ways to stop? Tunneling the highways. John, that was 17 billion a few years ago. It's probably 25 billion now. This is a year we've had the largest infrastructure bill ever. And is a tunnel idea gonna happen? No way. And you know what? It misses out on all these other opportunities. There's people in Hartford who want economic development. They want mental health services. They want better education. They want better health care. They want crime to go down. They want a better border. And you're talking tunneling the highways and giving people 50,000 a year for college forgiveness. That's missing the boat, John. Larry, those are your platitudes and talking points. They are far from the truth and have nothing to do with what we're proposing. What's you untrue, John? You went through a list of things. Oh, can I speak? I, we went through untrue? a list of things. Yep. And you, let's, let's start first with uh, I-91 and 84. It amazes me that you could live in, East, in West Hartford and not understand that this is the number one chokehold in the state of Connecticut, the number one chokehold in New England, number three nationally in terms of the worst truck traffic over the Buckley Bridge. When you throw in the fact that we have two levees bordering East Hartford and Hartford, both in bad need of repair because of sand piping, that caused the collapse of the Ninth Ward down in New Orleans, and cities like Hartford that have been in East Hartford who've been cut off from the river and all the economic development that occurs there, and North Hartford that between the Edna Viaduct and 84 has isolated that community and prevented any kind of economic growth. And Connecticut has paid more than its fair share into an infrastructure fund that's, that is going to benefit. And I'm proud that we passed legislation that called that it was historic amounts of funding. No 
Republican governor has returned any of the money we sent to him, Larry. And you know what? In the first congressional district, no mayor, where there are 15 Republican mayors in Selectman, has returned any of the money that they got from the federal government because they needed the money, money the John? to help the people mm. in their community. And that's the thing that you seem to miss here, is that it's about helping people in need. You have amnesia when it comes to the Republicans' idea of health. You didn't mention at all the $2 trillion tax cut that was given out in the Trump administration, 83% of which went to the nation's wealthiest 1%. And what did everybody else get? People have short, they don't have short memories. They remember what happened in 2008 and 2009 when they saw their 401k become a 101k. But guess what? During that time, Social Security never missed a payment, not a pension payment, not a disability payment, not a spousal payment, none of the above. Why? Because it has the full faith and credit of the American people and its trust. But it needs to be expanded, Larry, because they haven't had a benefit increase. You talk about the cost. A cost of milk in 1971 was 72 cents. Look at what it is today. And there's been no adjustment for those very seniors who have worked all their lives and put their, put their hard work and sweat and tears into having that kind of a retirement. And now you're saying that that's wasteful mm -hmm. spending, that we shouldn't be investing this kind of money in our seniors for the only program that many of them will have. Five million of them live below the poverty level, Larry. Below the poverty level. They've worked all their lives and get checks from their government below the poverty level. That's why I'm a strong advocate for Social Security, and so should you. John. Dr. Dr. Lady, yeah. I'm going to let you it was respond. two minutes. Uh, I'm of course, of course. I'm going to let you respond, and then we're going to move on. Yeah. Okay. So, John, you keep getting red in the face and yelling about Social Security like I don't care about Social Security. So that's a curveball to voters. I believe in Social Security. I'll defend Social Security. The, the tunneling idea... Yes, we need to fix our highways and expand them. Yes, we can cap 91. The problem is it's massive spending, John, that you don't have the money for. If someone magically gives us the money for that, fine. And you know what, John? I went around to Hartford 30 times this campaign, 30 times, talking to neighborhood groups, night outs, park cleanups, block parties, having coffee with leaders. No one mentioned tunneling as an idea for Hartford. They don't care about tunneling. Fix the highways, fix the levees, expand them. No one's talking about tunneling. So it's a waste of money. You're talking about inflation and spending. Uh, example number three, John, that's spending. So there's plenty of opportunity to do better. And tunneling the highways is not a good, good idea. It's been a waste of time. And I think people in Hartford, if you ask them, they're not asking for that. Larry, did you ever ask the Department of Transportation did you ever ask any engineers? Did you John, ever I'm look saying at we a should fix we should fix the highways. Are you happy with I don't know. The, with it's the, the plan it's different that was between designed fixing the highways and tunneling the highways. Gentlemen, John, stop. fixing versus tunneling. Gentlemen, you know, the, you, I think, John, John, Mr. You Larson, please. I, so. Listen, if you talk over each other, that's a hard little bit to do with our uh, with our timekeepers, okay? We're going to move on. Okay? I think we exhausted that subject. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Larson. Uh, the Senate has put, a, uh, put off a vote on a bill that would codify same-sex marriage until after the midterm elections. The bill had previously passed in the House. Do you support legislation codifying same-sex marriage? We do, and I and will continue to do so. And we have to do so because we ought to listen to the Republicans loud and clear when they say what they're going to do. They're going to follow through on it. Uh, and if you don't believe it, just look what happened with Roe versus Wade. And listen to what Clarence Thomas has had to say as well, and how he feels that it's important to go after contraceptive and gay marriage next. This is, what, this is why we need a Congress that will defend women's reproductive rights, that will protect contraceptives, that will make sure that gay marriages are allowed to continue, that, that are allowed to get people you love you ought to be able to marry. It's that, it's that simple, Ray. And yes, I will always stand up and fight for that. Dr. Laser. I agree with John. I think we're on the same page with that. I, uh, I take care of gay women, trans women, I, heterosexual women. Um, 
I support the gay community. I support all their rights. I support their ability to get married. Uh, I will fight for that. I, I will lock arms with John. I think we're on the same page with that, just like women's rights to uh, choose. So that issue, I think the difference will be is that I can have maybe a bigger effect talking with the history of my career, talking to patients and going to Washington and doing that. But I am in agreement. We need to back up gay rights. Great. Um, next question is for you, Dr. Laser. And we've, we've gone over this uh, before, but if you stick to the kind of germ of the question, I would really appreciate it. The question is from Lottie in Southington. If elected, would you protect and strengthen programs like Social Security and Medicare? We're going to go there again? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, we have to support Social Security. So John is, is going in circles here. I don't, I don't know what he's saying. He may be talking about other people, but I totally believe in backing Social Security. We need to increase the benefits. We need a sound plan, though. People need to read about Social Security 2100. Don't take his word for it. Don't take my word for it. Read about it. There's a good review. It's actually a left-sided think tank that talks about it. It says, John, if you can have a plan, if you make benefit increases, make them permanent. His plan does not make them permanent. Am I right about that? No. The five years. OK. People just check, do a fact check on John to see if he got that right because he did not get that right. And he knows that the, your proposal, Social Security 2100, says after five years, the benefits go away. And the, there's a trick here, people. This is the trick. John increases benefits for five years, and they go back down. What does he do to taxes? They stay up. So it looks like it's financially better than it is. That's the trick, OK? That's what he's done. People need to read about it. And again, there's a two-page review that you could, Social Security 2100, Center for Budget and uh, Policy Priorities, and you will get a two-page review that says exactly what I'm talking about. It needs to be saved. We need a sound plan. I'm in favor of saving Social Security. I'm in favor of some benefits, but his plan has two faults. It doesn't make the benefits permanent, and financially runs out of money in four years. We need a plan that's gonna work for at least 30 years or so, and we can't have a plan that's only for four. Mr. Larson. Yes, well, uh, again, I don't know where to begin because Larry wants to lock arms with me in some ways, but that's who he's not going to be locking arms with in Washington, D.C. On all of these issues, he's going to be locking arms with Republicans. And what they've said, again, is very clear. Let's compare and contrast what the Republican plans are. Their plans are to cut, privatize, and end Social Security. Uh, they've done so, and they've said it in the Republican study plan. They've said so with Rick Scott's plan. That's who he's going to be caucusing with. That's who he's going to be voting for. That's who he's going to be working for if he were fortunate enough to go to Congress. People of the state of Connecticut and people around this country are not fooled by what the Republicans are saying. Just today, again, there was another release of what they're going to do in the Budget Committee where they say they are going to cut across the board entitlements like Social Security, a 21 percent across the board cut. We're there to expand Social Security for the first time in 51 years with all the benefit increases that are needed. Larry thinks that that's wasteful spending. He says platitudes that he's for Social Security, but doesn't have a plan to tell you how he'd get there or what he would spend on. We do. We tax people over $400,000. We say to them, it's about time we lifted the cap on you and you pay your fair share. They haven't paid their fair share. Most people don't realize that after $142,000, you stop paying into Social Security. So Bill Gates, for example, stops paying into Social Security on January 1st. So isn't it fair and isn't it the right thing to do to lift that cap so that nobody under any of the plans that we've proposed in this Congress who is, has an income below $400,000 is going to be taxed? That's the fair thing to do. 
That's what we're doing with Social Security 2100. And oh yes, by the way, it's paid in full and never is intended for it not to be paid in full. And what has to happen for it not to be paid in full? Congress would have to vote. What a thing to ask them. Now I know in the Senate, Mitch McConnell doesn't like to vote on the four, 547 bills that we've sent over there. But that's what's going on in Washington. You're ready to lock arms with the party that is going to take us back to yesterday. Whether it's highway construction, you think it's good to go back to the Eisenhower administration, fine, God bless you. But it's time for us to go ahead and deal with the problems that we face and not put your head in the sand and say, oh no, we can't, we can't spend any money there. Never said you can't spend any money there, John. And I want you to look at the voters and tell them that Social Security 2100 is paid in full. For how many years, John? How many years is it paid in full? Let's be honest with the voters. Your plan, how many years is it paid in full? Social Security 2100, when it's passed into law, will be paid in full. And Social benefits Security, don't stop after five Social years? Social Security, will, if Congress has to vote, and Congress should be voting every year. Let me ask you, Larry, do you think Congress should vote on Social Security? I, I think we need a plan in Social Security. John, I got that a works. plan. What's yours? My plan would be one that would be fiscally sound That's for at least 30. That's not a plan. Yeah, John, I, I think it's, you want to, I'm happy to debate you with Social Security I because I think Republicans win that, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. But your plan has benefits for five years that go away. Are you telling people that's not true? Yes, As I'm it's telling written? people that's not true. We well, voters need benefits. to go out and read because I'm on a different planet right now in terms of what Social Security 2100 says. <laughs> I think you've got to read and see what it says. I'm in favor of saving Social Security. I think there needs to be benefits. But the, you know what puts Social Security at risk? College loan forgiveness for 50000 per student. Tunneling highways. Overspending. That puts Social Security at risk. Social Security takes up 25% of our budget. We need to save it. It is a great way to fight poverty. It is a great way to make our seniors stable. I'm looking at you in the eye, and I will fight to save Social Security. But John's plan has a few issues that he's not talking about, and he should be honest about that. This is the most critical plan in the nation. It's the nation's number one anti-poverty program for the elderly. It's the number one anti-poverty program for children. And the Republicans do have a plan. They plan to cut, they plan to privatize, and they plan to end it. That's who you're locking Republicans arms with. Republicans plan to That's who you're job. locking arms with. You don't have a plan. You have their plan. Our plan says, no, we protect Social Security and we expand those benefits. Expand benefits that especially people who have worked all their lives and get below poverty level checks from their mm -hmm. government, while Republicans are content to give $83 trillion in debt and giving 83% of the tax cut to the wealthiest 1%. That is the difference between the two parties, Larry. Dr. So, Lazer, so John, arms John with you just said Gentlemen, Republicans want to uh, cut Social Security here. or eliminate Social Security. I, I just think you have to be on record about that, that that is, that is not true, and I don't know where. You know, let's have an intelligent debate, people, okay? Let's talk about facts. We want to save Social Security. Let's have a smart plan. Let's make benefits permanent so seniors don't think they're going to get a benefit, and then it's taken away. Let's have it paid for. Yes, we need to increase taxes to save Social Security. I totally get that. We need to come up with a plan that works. Yeah. So, next Gentlemen, question. I, let's go on. Yeah, well, let's, let's move on to the next question. We will. You just need to vote on it, Larry. That's all. All right. Um, this is a question for Mr. Larson. It's been 12 years since the Affordable Care Act became law. Should Obamacare be strengthened, improved, or modified to meet the needs of patients, or should it be struck down altogether? It should be, it should be improved and expanded. And listen, again, I'll go to West Hartford. And um, Mr. Uh, Rod Yearwood stood up at, after we uh, passed uh, the American Rescue Plan and said, I want to thank you, Congressman, because I was paying premiums of $1,300 a month. Now, this is real savings at a time of inflation. Now I'm paying $20 a month. And with that money, with that savings, I'm now going to be able to save for my daughter's, my two daughters' education system. I want to thank you for that. 
because that's what it's all about, getting people the kind of care that they need. The Republicans tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act 72 times over an eight-year period and failed every single time. The American people need this. We need a public option as well, but I'm proud of what we were able to do. To They want to go back to a time when you're penalized and pre-existing conditions aren't even covered. This is uh, not the way to go. Dr. Laser. Yeah, health, everyone needs health care. Health care needs to change. Health care is too expensive, it's too confusing, and there's too many disparities in health care. Inner city people don't do as well. Minorities don't do as well. Those are the major issues for health care. We need smart policies. We just don't need to pour money into it. Do you know that in the United States, the average cost per person for health care is $12,500. The next most expensive health care country that, with health care is Switzerland at $7,500. We don't need more money poured into health care. We need smarter plans. We need value-based plans. Value-based plans would say, if this gentleman or this woman has diabetes or congestive heart failure, let's prevent them from having to go to the emergency room. Let's have a nurse call them. Let's even have someone go visit their house educate them so we prevent those emergency room visits. Three, four, five thousand. We may prevent an admission to the hospital, maybe twenty or thirty thousand. Right now, health care is fee for service. So if I see thirty patients in a day versus twenty patients in a day, I make more money. I don't get compensated if my patient does well. I get compensated based on volume. Health care needs to change. You know, John is at a um, Healthcare, just pouring, look at John's example. So John said, listen to this gentleman. He was paying $1,300 a month, and now he's paying $20 a month. You know what? That's a lucky guy. But who's going to be paying for that? The middle class would pay for that. Your health insurance is going up. We've seen health insurance go up and up and up. It's squeezing small business. It's squeezing families. We need to find cost-effective plans. It's not just pouring money into it. And that's what John always does. He just pours money into it. Great, this guy went from $1,300 to $20. Someone's got to pay for that, and your, your middle-class health insurance has to go up. There's constant ways we could do this better. Health insurance can be run as a better, we need competition, and we need good plans. A good example I give is UConn Health Center. The state of Connecticut bails them out $250 million a year. We'll drive down Main Street in Hartford, where Main Street hits Pratt, and go all the way down to the West Indian Social Club, and tell me how many doctor's offices you see. Zero. Why is that? Because we have a warped system in healthcare. We need to spend dollars more intelligently. We can do this, but we need to find the right lanes. We want quality healthcare. We want healthcare that we trust. I've been doing that for 32 years, talking to patients. I know a little bit more about healthcare than you. I've been there. We need to come up with systems that are cost effective with good quality. I think I bring that more than John. We have come up with those systems, and the people you are willing to lock arms with want to destroy those systems, want to return to pre-existing conditions. 35 million people have gained access to health care under the Affordable Care Act, or what the Republicans derisively called Obamacare. Fact check and newsflash, Obama does care because he cares about people and so do we, and we built on the ACA more than four million people have gained coverage since Biden has become president. We also capped senior drug costs, again, dealing with their concerns and dealing with inflation. We also capped senior insulin costs at $35 a month. Those are actions that we have taken that you call spend, 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 that's right, we spent it in an area where it was most needed. We didn't give away 83% of a tax cut to the nation's wealthiest 1% and let everybody else handle what might trickle down from them. We continue to do this with Medicare negotiations <clears throat> in this Congress, and this is something you've said you'd repeal. You'd repeal the, the uh, you know, Inflation Reduction Act. You repeal that, which is 
deals with all the issues of climate change and us I, being I the never leader said that, in the John. world. I don't know where you, you read that. You didn't say that you were to repeal the uh, Inflation Reduction Act? I never said that. You I'm a pro-climate pro politician. politician. The commitment I, or lack I would, of commitment to America? If, if you want to look at how much spending you've spent over the last three bills, we'll talk about that. But I'm a pro-climate person. I, I believe in climate. I'm a scientist. I think we need to address it. We need to do it smartly. I don't know if we've always done it in a smart way where it puts us in an awkward situation with energy right now and trying to help our, our friends in Europe. It, look at the cost so, of, of fuel in California. It's about $7 a gallon. Look at how that affects middle class people. So I am pro-climate. We have to do it in a proper you transition. You just don't want to spend anything on it. No, John, John this, I, is I, a I, so this is the difference. So John is, you know, never want to spend. Do you, you see the extremes? I believe we need to spend money, we need to, but we need to be more careful how we spend money. Never have we spent as much money as when John has been in office. Never. Look at our debt, look at, look at inflation, look at our taxes. America's going on a course of massive spending. I would push back. That doesn't mean no spending. The problem, John, when you spend so much money, it doesn't leave money for the climate. It doesn't leave money for Social Security. It doesn't leave money for inner cities. That's the problem. Loan forgiveness, 50000 per student. That's 100000 for a couple that may be making up to $250,000. Where's that money coming from? Where's the money coming from the tunnel? Your plans are pie in the sky in terms of spending. And people pay the price. And that's inflation, taxes, and debt. Real quick. I'm glad that uh, not everyone thinks that uh, dealing with the number one congested highway system in the state, in New England, number three in the nation with regard to truck traffic, the levees that protect both Hartford and East Hartford think that that is excessive spending, Larry, or think that that's a pipe dream. That is reality, and that's what's going to help commerce. That's what's going to help reconnect our both towns and our communities to the riverfront and help end the isolation of North Hartford as well. Uh, you know, you must have your head in the sand when it comes to stuff like that because how you can... Are we going to tunnel the highways, John? Gentlemen. Are we tunneling the highways? Gentlemen. Are we, we going to tunnel them? We're going to do whatever the department Gentlemen, you've been talking about for 10 years. Gentlemen. Are we going to tunnel the highways? We're Gentlemen. Gonna, so I agree in fixing the levees Gentlemen. and fixing the highways, but if we're going to tunnel, that, that, be honest to the voters. We're Gentlemen. not going to do it because it's too much money. That's the truth. Gentlemen, we have <clears throat> covered this ground a few times already tonight. Can we move on? I understand. I understand both, both sides here, but let's move on. We have, we have lots of other things we can talk about. Okay, we've already covered this ground. This is a question for Dr. Laser. Uh, this is from Nora in Manchester. If elected, what would you do on the federal level to make long-term care in the U.S. more affordable? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I've seen that firsthand with a father who's 91, uh, that we, we had to move him into a uh, senior living place uh, six months ago. <clears throat> it's very difficult to find help. He needed 24-hour-a-day help. Uh, the last 30 months, I visited my dad, 28. Uh, I go up once a month for a long weekend and in the summer a week here or there. Uh, but he lives about three hours away and I'm an OBGYN so I'm on call. And I have a sister, two sisters who help out. It's a very difficult problem. Uh, we definitely need help in that area. And again, so this would be the theme. We have to be careful about spending because we need money for other areas. John's going to exaggerate and say I don't want to spend money on anything. This is an area we need to look at. And there's an opportunity here. I mean, this is where our immigration policy, if we improve that, we can have people come and help with that. Um, so I think we need a policy to help with seniors for long-term care. We want to give people a quality life, right? And most people want to stay in their own homes. Um, and there's ways to do that. But it, that's an area that I think you need help. I, I don't think you totally make that a public service. But you can help private companies come up with situations that can help senior citizens. So yeah, that's a big issue. I've seen that firsthand. And I think we all want to be treated with respect when we're older. Well, I think that, um, again, you hear an awful lot of platitudes, uh, but no, no plan and no, no real desire to step in and No help. desire? And wh wh where's, 
Where's the plan? How do you accomplish that? How do you accomplish that, John? I think we've we got, need plans we've, we've that got look a at plan. senior it's called citizens the Affordable that help Care people. Act. That's what, th that's what we put forward. And we stand behind that. And we say that we have to continue to improve that. And we have to have public options. And we have to make sure that health care is available and accessible to everyone. Yeah, I'm giving that's the That's the goal John. and that we that. have to keep working for. Mm. But you don't, you're, you're willing to lock arms with the people that are going to repeal that. that, are gonna repeal that. That's what they've said. That's what they put down in writing. And just today, again, they're talking about what they're going to do to on the budget committee with entitlements. You, you hooked up with the wrong party, Larry. What can I tell you? And that, that's who you're locking arms with. Look, the Republican Party has a history of amazing leaders. You look at Abraham Lincoln. You look at Teddy Roosevelt. And a less famous person, Margaret Chase Smith, a senator from Maine. And she was the first senator in 1950 to stand up to Joe McCarthy. She stood up there in her first year and she said, this is wrong and I'm gonna push back. You know, just four hours ago, Adam Kinzinger endorsed me. He's the only, I'm the only Republican that he's endorsed because I'll stand up and I'll say what's right. I don't know if you've done that with Biden, with the border, with crime issues, but I don't have any problem standing up with people and saying if they're right or wrong. Neither, neither do I. Okay. Neither do is I. That, but we have a history of great leaders, and leaders need to have a few things. They need to have smart policy, they need to have empathy, and they need to have trust. And I think that's what voters are looking for, and that's what we're trying to bring to this campaign. I think that we can do that. I think I have a history, a reputation of, of doing that in a hospital for 32 years. Um, and, and I enjoy that challenge. I think that's a challenge, and yes, I do agree the Republican Party needs to shift in some areas. I also think the Democratic Party needs to shift a lot. How's crime? How's crime doing, John? How's the border? You know, the most common cause of death in our country under the age of 50 is opiate overdose. And that has increased four times since Joe Biden took over. We need a pushback. Hartford has a 20-year high murder rate, as do many cities, because as we saw George Floyd get murdered, and we said, yes, we need oversight, Yes, we need de-escalation. We ended up vilifying the police officers. And there was a push from your party, John, to decrease police officers. You know, when I run around to Hartford, and I went 30 times into Hartford, people want more police. They don't want less. They want more police because the greatest deterrent to crime is the presence of police. And when I talk to police, they feel like, what do you want us to do? Well, you know what the people want? They want you to do their job. They want oversight. They want de-escalation. And we lost that, and that was a democratic thing. We lost the border, that was a democratic thing. Education hasn't done well. Do you think we did well with education during COVID? You're tied into teachers unions. You take money from the teachers union. The teachers unions give 99% of their money to the Democratic Party. Do you think that influences the Democrats on working with education? Our kids got hurt staying out of school. Their anxiety levels went up. Their learning gaps went up, John. There was a price for that. Can you challenge all those people you get money from? You get about a million dollars a year from special interest, from PAC money. Can you go against them? Can you fight for that? Because I think it should be about the kids and not the unions. Well, again, I, I don't know where to start because you were rambled on on so many different fronts. But uh, since you did focus on crime and you did focus on as part of it, of the diatribe. Uh, let me say, are you aware of what we got for West Hartford for crime and for the police? And would you be in favor of that? Are you aware of the 15 police officers that we got money for in Hartford, new police officers to go on the streets? You said you walked the streets of Hartford. Did you ever walk with um, Mothers United Against Violence? Was that, go the to one the time, was that the, the one time the, you're in Hartford, John? Where the shootings have actually taken place? Have you ever worked with people in Hartford? With the people Harper in Hartford say that, they don't see Harper you, John. That's what they tell me. That, that care and people that are experiencing on the street what the problems are. We got money for every single community in the first congressional district. 
And we got it and we gave it to the municipality and the Board of Education so that those locally elected officials, of which 15 of them of the 27 are Republicans. And you know what? None of them returned any of that money, Larry. They all used it constructively in their communities and in their district, and they spent it because it was the right thing to do during the midst of a global pandemic with all kinds of bottleneck problems that caused supply chain issues that further were compounded by the most horrific event that I can recall in government in the takeover of the Capitol on January the 6th, which cast a pall over this election and everything else because of what's going to happen in terms of the transfer of power in Washington. You're associated and willing to lock arms with the people who are going to take over, who wish, hope they're able to take over, and the people who are in denial about the peaceful transition of an election, in denial about the election of Joe Biden, in denial about climate change and that it exists, against women's reproductive rights. This is what's on the ballot, against voting rights, unwilling to take up campaign finance reform that I have been a sponsor of every single year that I've been in Congress. Don't tell me about special interest in teachers. Yes, I'm a former school teacher. And I'm proud of my association with every single one of those teachers. I have a daughter who's a teacher as well, and I'm proud of her. She teaches history at East Hartford High School. And you know what? Those teachers work incredibly long hours and for not much pay either. And they do an outstanding job. And it's about time we also recognize that they shouldn't be penalized under a social security system. And yes, if that costs money, I'm willing to spend that money by saying, yeah, we ought to lift the cap on people over $400,000 so that they are paying their fair share that, the, that a person making thirty-five dollars or $50,000 is paying. That's what this election is about. That's what the transfer of power is about, protecting the very wealthy at the top and hoping that what trickles down will satisfy everybody in the middle class. Well, it isn't. People have caught on to that game. They understand they want direct relief, like a child tax credit that uplifts children out of poverty here in the, the first district and across the state of Connecticut and around this country, because those children's lives matter. Dr. Laser, I'm going to let you respond, and then we're going to move on. Yeah, John, I mean, uh, again, you talk in ways that I'm not sure what you're saying is that uh, um, I believe spending in certain areas is important, but excessive spending has a price to it. And as you go around and say, here's $20 million for Manchester, here's $20 million for this town, just make sure to tell people that that's one of the reasons why we have inflation and we have high taxes and high debt. There's a cost to excessive spending. You just don't have an endless supply of money that you can keep spending. And yes, I've been in Hartford a lot, talk to the people, and they want protection. They want more police. And the Democratic Party, your party, has vilified the police officers. Look at defund the police. How did that go in Burlington, Vermont? How did that go in San Francisco? How did that go in Chicago? How's, you want to get on a subway in New York? I think most people, most voters, would look at the Republican Party as a party that backs up the police officers and would be a better party for crime. I think we do a better job with that. But I'm happy, again, look, we're talking for a half an hour, and it gets heated at times, but this is democracy. This is what you want. I'll get back to my initial point. John's only doing one debate. One debate. John, if you feel so strongly and you're so pro-democracy, let's do this again a couple times, and we can get more into these issues and talk more. I'm happy to talk about all these issues. The problem is, John, you're talking out both sides of your mouth. John's saying he's all this, but he's not one, willing to do more than one debate. 
John takes over a million dollars from special interest and PAC money. I took money from one, which was the American College of OBGYN. John has to answer for what he does with that money and why he takes it. You can't do both, John. If you're pro-democracy, like we talk about, you should be willing to stand up and talk about the economy, talk about the inner cities, talk about the border, talk about Social Security. That's what voters want. Larry, I talk about them every single day, and I'm out in this district every day, and as I told you before, you're welcome to come to me to any seniors. In fact, you're welcome to come to me to Manchester anytime and talk to the people here in Manchester about how they felt that that money that came into this community was wasteful spending because you're telling the people at Manchester that, oh, don't be fooled by that money. That money somehow is going to create a debt. You don't deserve that money here in Manchester. You don't have local tax issues or state tax issues. You didn't have a Republican Party at the national level that repealed state and local property taxes that caused double taxation in the state of Connecticut so that they could give. You don't ever mention about the money that they wasted, $2 trillion unpaid for, that goes to the nation's wealthiest 1%. But you bemoan the fact that somebody here as a resident in Manchester is going to get money so their property taxes don't go up, so their police and fire departments can be better equipped and have what they need, or that teachers might be able to have better instruments, or there might be for people who had to stay home during COVID, that they had computers that they were able to take home and laptops. You think that's wasteful spending. Those were necessary things that people needed during a global pandemic. You guys also have amnesia about inflation. You think Joe Biden came into office and there was inflation. Well, guess what? A global pandemic, the, a war, the largest war in 79 years in Europe that impacted both oil and wheat production impacts globally inflation. We're part of a global economy we have responsibilities here, and when we talk about dealing with this, cutting and lowering the national debt by a trillion dollars just this last fiscal year. <laughs> John. Just this please. last fiscal year, Larry. Gentlemen, we, we have to move on. This is the last I, question. Don't I get a rebuttal on that? Well, you're going to have plenty of time I've got in the a last. minute and a half you can, uh, less time, so I think I can make that up. Well, you can make that up when we, on this question. Yeah, okay. And this is about term limits. This is from a viewer. Uh, do you support term limits for Congress and the Supreme Court? And please explain why or why not. And this goes to Mr. Larson first. We do have term limits. We have elections every two years for the United States Congress. And uh, I would like to see us come up with a system in Congress and have proposed this where we actually have four-year terms for members of Congress, staggered every two years, like the Senates are staggered a third of the body every two years, and in that way, I think, give people more repetitive uh, opportunities with respect to it. And uh, that's would be, that would be my suggestion with regard to term limits. Well, there's a reason that most Americans want term limits. And most Americans think it should be 12 years. And there's a reason why they want that, is that's because they want new energy and new ideas coming into Washington. They also want politicians to get away from special interest money. That's the reason for it. John has served 24 years. I think that's an awful long time. I think there is time for new ideas and new energy. So like most Americans, I would propose a 12-year term limit. I think it's better for government. I think we can get new ideas. And we need to get people away from these fixed systems. So, I, I take that that was a no about more debates. And I think, again, we're debating for a half an hour. And that's a no. You, that's a dodge. So we need to look at that. Because if you believe in democracy, which I think most people do, you're going to stand up and say, we should debate. So a lady who came up before we started this and said, Madison, and talked about our found, founding fathers, that we should get up and debate. It's not always pretty arguing back and forth. But people need to hear that. They need to hear our ideas. What's our idea for Social Security? And let's be honest about what those ideas are. What's our, our idea for health care? We spend a tremendous amount of money. We can come up with better systems. What's our idea for the inner cities? 
The inner cities are not looking good, John. You've been in office for 24 years. We need to make those inner cities places of optimism, places where the economy can work. I had a press conference, and lifelong Democrats who had businesses in Hartford for 45 years are spitting nails because they want change. We need to do better. When I campaign, that's what I tell people. We need to do better. Better at the border, better at spending, better at health care, better at education, better at these things. And I think that's what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. Response? Well, I'm glad that Larry wants everything better. He wants everything better. Uh, he has no plan to pay for it, but he says absolutely on anything that he think is not a talking point or that isn't going to strike an emotional chord with people. He says, well, I agree with John on that. But then where, you know, the re typical Republican talking point comes in, he tries to press that issue. But <laughs> look at the facts. The facts are, this is probably the most consequential election in the nation's history. Because what it means in the aftermath of January the 6th. I was there with fences in barbed wire around the Capitol after a seditious element took over the Capitol. 146 police officers injured, three died, more than a million dollars of damage, and yet 147 members of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives said the election results weren't valid. And that has only continued to grow. And they've locked arms, and now as said as this next election approaches, that they're going to go back and contest those elections as well. Our very democracy is at stake here, our republic. And the question is going to be, it comes down to who are we going to turn this grand experiment over to? I believe that the Democrats are going to maintain control of both the House and the Senate because the American people understand this. And they understand what's going on in Washington. They see it every single day. They see a party that stokes fear. They see a party that tries to exploit people, but has no specific plan for the future. Dr. Laser, the final word. So I think this is a critical election. I, I really do. And John, in my lead video getting into this campaign, I came out and said January 6 was a blow to our democracy. And I spoke out against that. That's not OK. I, I also think you know the press secretary of Biden right now, Karine Pierre, uh, said that uh, Trump stole the election in 2016. And there were other Democrats who said that. So I'm sure you spoke against that, right? So you have to call it both sides. I think what you're looking for is you're looking for leaders that have some character and can call their own party out and call the other party out. John's a nice guy. I, I think John's a nice guy, and I think he's a good person. And, and I, you know, I know we got heated, but I think we need to hear these issues. When I'm left with 30 minutes to try to talk in front of a TV audience, I think we need to be a little bit aggressive. You heard him not wanting to debate. Listen to that. That's democracy, right? No, that's not democracy. He needs to answer for that, because we need it's an all-time low level of confidence in government. 12% of people have faith in Congress. And John wants to debate 30 minutes each. That's a message. I'm here to provide some new energy and new ideas. I definitely recognize the Republican Party needs a change. And that's one of the reasons I'm coming in. We need new leaders, leaders that we can look up to and trust. I'm a pro-choice Republican. I think the election was fair. I think January 6th was a blow to our democracy, and I've said that publicly. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I have a lot of excitement to do this. I'm 60 years old. I have three kids. I have a great wife. And I'm excited to take this on and to make a difference. I think our government needs that. I think it needs more people coming in. Um, and 
yes, I believe we need to save certain programs, but we need to seriously look at how much money we're spending because that is leading to inflation and that is leading to families really struggling. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you so much for your answers tonight. We do have time now for final remarks. You both have two minutes and we start with Mr. Larson. It's an honor to serve this district and I'm proud to have done it for 12 terms. And I ask your support for a 13th term. I ask that support because we've been able to help this economy out in extraordinary ways. Whether it's the F-35 or whether it's baby formulas, we've shown that we can work across the aisle to accomplish things and get things done for this great nation of ours. But most importantly, in making sure that we're helping the people here at home. That's what it's all about. I go around this district and listen and learn and then take people's proposals and ideas and turn them into action. We've, got, we've taken action and we've gotten results for this district. I'm so proud of the efforts that we've done in manufacturing, so proud that during the worst economic downturn in aerospace history, not a single machinist, not a single engineer was laid off at Pratt Whitney Aircraft because of the work that we've been able to do over the years in promoting the F-35. And I did that bipartisanly, including when I was in the minority. I was proud to nominate Liz Cheney for the Profiles and Courage Award because I believe she had the guts and the gumption to stand up to her party. But her party has abandoned her and they've abandoned Mr. Kissinger because they are a party of extreme. And that party of extreme wants to take over this country. 30 seconds. And we cannot stand for that. America has got to rise up and make sure that what we witnessed and saw on January 6 cannot happen again. And we're not going to turn over the reins of government to those individuals. That simply seconds. can't stand. John Kennedy said we could put a man on the moon in 10 years and we did it in nine. That's America. We're an America of aspiration. We need to come together. And because the challenges in front of us are too great for us not to put our best shot forward. Thank you. Dr. Laser. Yeah, it's been an honor to uh, represent the Republican Party and to go through this process. I think there's an opportunity right now for us to ask for better, better government. People elect congressional representatives for two years for a reason, that they respond to the voters, that they're out there meeting their voters, and that they're debating. That's what you want for a representative, to get out and represent you and to listen to your ideas. Look, Connecticut is a great state, and we have great government programs for defense, but the private sector is hurting. From 2008 to 2020, Connecticut had the worst economic growth of any state, and a UConn professor, Fred Cartons, had said, not just last place, distant last place. We need to look at spending. I agree that there are areas that we need to help people, but we also have to not do it excessively. During COVID, a family of four in 19 Democratic states would get the equivalent of $100,000 a year not working. I saw people who had small businesses. They couldn't get their employees back to work. That's a double, double negative. You have small businesses that can't function, and you have government paying excessive, excessive wages to people. There needs to be a balance. I'm not saying you leave people in the cold. I said there needs to be a balance. If you look at the statistics, the bottom 20% with government subsidies make as much as the bottom 40%. There's something wrong with that. We need to help people, but we need to have motivations to get people back to work. 30 seconds. I love the inner cities and I love healthcare. Inner cities right now need a lot of attention. They're not places of optimism and we need to change that. We need to do a lot of things. Crime, we need to promote early education so when kids come to school, they're ready, particularly in the inner cities. I'm excited about doing this. Ten I'm a seconds. worker. I tend to do a lot of projects and get things done. It would be an honor to serve you, and uh, I look forward to more discussion in the future. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. And thank you for watching Connecticut Public and the League of Women Voters of Connecticut's debate series. Don't change the channel just yet. Connecticut Public's Frankie Graziano is standing by with your post-debate coverage 
On the next debate, it'll happen this Thursday, October 13th, between the candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives in Connecticut's 4th Congressional District. Dr. Kalila Brown-Dean will be your host, live from Norwalk Community College. If you have a question you'd like to ask those candidates, head to ctpublic.org slash vote. I'm Ray Hardman. Have a great evening. Thank you to Ray Hardman for moderating what we have to say was a contentious debate here inside the SBM Charitable Foundation Auditorium at Manchester Community College tonight. Thank you to Ray Hardman and thank you to my friends at Connecticut Public for putting on tonight's debate. I'm Frankie Graziano for Connecticut Public and in a moment I'm going to be joined by Ronnie Newton of Weha.com and CT Insiders Dan Hard to break down the debate that we just saw. But first, I'm going to talk to a couple of people representing the candidates tonight that are going to be on the campaign trail with them this fall to talk about the issues. And tonight, they're going to talk to me about how they think that the candidates fare tonight. My first guest is Jay Moran, who is the mayor of uh, Manchester. Jay, just want to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Not only is he the mayor of Manchester, but you also are a college athletic administrator. Correct. And at working at the University of Bridgeport, I just want to ask you, if these two are running a race tonight and you're, of course, you're paying attention to John Larson, the Democrat. How do you think if he's running that race, he fared tonight? I think he finished the finish line, finished first. I think he did a great job. I think John Larson always listens. He responds to his citizens. He responds to local uh, leaders and municipalities. John is a leader, and obviously there's no better number one champion for Social Security in the country than John Larson. And, you know, John is always there to help. He's trying to take on inflation. He's trying to bring down health care costs, energy costs. He's going to protect and expand that Social Security. But we talked a lot about the ARPA funds tonight, and I want to tell you, we're happy. It wasn't $20 million, $40 million that came to the town of Manchester to help us do so many things to get us recovered from the COVID. Just really quickly, Jay, if we're talking about the next two years, and maybe you get that with John Larson if he wins, what kind of unfinished business do you guys have together? Well, I think, you know, he's, you know we're, all, we're worried about, I think, mental health issues. John will help us with it coming out of COVID. We need some support, uh, federal support. I think the schools are always looking for more support. I think John Larson will be there. there. And uh, as issues come along, he, there's no better person. When you pick up the phone, he returns your call. And that's what we want for someone to go to D.C., not to forget their constituents back home. John Larson always cares about his people, always remembers where he comes from, and there's no better fighter for his district than John Larson in the country. Jay Moran, the mayor of Manchester, joining us tonight to talk to John Larson. Thank you so much. I have another guest joining me right now, Anastasia Yap, who is a politician in central Connecticut. And Anastasia, you guys have been walking the campaign trail together in central Connecticut, in Newington and West Hartford. And I just have to ask you, you guys both tout fiscal responsibility. You guys, you work in, uh, in SBA loan administration. I just want to ask you if you think that we got to saw we got to see tonight Larry Laser, the fiscal conservative. Do you think we got to see that tonight? Absolutely, I think we got to see Larry Laser. I understand, uh, you know, he's for fiscal responsibility. I think we need more debates, and I think that um, if we if uh, Larry was um, allowed that opportunity, that we'd be able to see more of what he's going to do for us. The two of you guys are relative newcomers to politics, I would yeah. say. A year in yourself, and uh, just about a year and a half ago, we had Larry Laser announce that he was going to be in this race. Do you think people got to know Larry Laser tonight? Absolutely. Larry Laser is for the people. Larry's, Larry Laser walks the street of Hartford, walks the street of West Hartford, and the inner cities. He is for the people. Yes. Anastasia Yap, good luck this November. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And on that last question, it kind of goes to electability, I would say. I want to know if people know Larry Laser, who is, again, a, a relative newcomer to politics. So Ronnie Newton of Weha.com, i got to ask you, do you think people got to know Larry Laser tonight? I'm going to try to read my notes. Ronnie Newton, asking you uh, one more time, sorry if you didn't hear me. Just want to know if people got to know Larry Laser tonight here inside the SBM uh, Charitable Foundation Auditorium. I don't know if that works. 
talking. I just asked you a question. Sorry. Did you really? Yes. Oh my gosh, I didn't hear you. I'm so sorry. No, no problem. But I just wanted to. We're, we're talking with Anastasia uh, Yap about electability, right? And uh, whether or not people know Larry Laser. Do you think people got to know him tonight? I do think people got to know him, and I think um, I I got a note from uh, a text from somebody during the debate, and I think people said he seemed like he was holding his own and had some good ideas. What do you think, Danny? The election outcome, unfortunately for democracy, doesn't hinge on the performance of the candidates. It hinges on how well known their name is and how much money they have. And in that, we do not have a balanced race here. Joining us now inside the SBM Aud Charitable Foundation Auditorium, I got Dan Hart uh, to my immediate left, who is the columnist and associate editor at Hearst Connecticut Media. Ronnie Newton's over there on the left, all the way to the left, the managing editor and owner of Weha.com. And a couple of inflection points tonight, but when we talk specifically about highways, tunnels, and spending, we saw uh, Larry Laser uh, get, to, get to pop uh, uh, John Larson a little bit. Here's, here's where I want to I go with this. We talk a lot of, uh, in recent years about John Larson's vision for the future, which includes uh, treating this badly congested area, the I-84 viaduct in 84, with a tunnel in that area and, and, and burying that part, and then also uh, burying part of I-91 uh, with a tunnel along the Connecticut River. So did you get a sense of whether or not that's coming soon? Larry Laser saying, he doesn't think it's going to happen, especially in the year of infrastructure. He thought that it was a troubling sign. Yeah, Dr. Laser is making a twin criticism here. On the one hand, he's saying that John Larson and the Democrats, uh, Congressman Larson, and the Democrats are spending too much money. And they're spending money every time that Congressman Larson comes to the district with $10 million here and $10 million there. He, he made a point in the debate, tell them also that it's raising their taxes, increasing debt, and causing inflation. So he wants to make that point, which is a standard Republican criticism. But on the res in respect to the tunnel, which could be 40, 50, 60, 80 billion dollars, we're talking about something that makes the big dig look like new plumbing. And, 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 and we were talking 17, 25 million, yeah. billion earlier tonight, but well, you're saying no, it could be, well north no, of 40. You're talking about burying the entire last two miles of 84 and going under Colt Park, under historic Colt Park, to East Hartford and rejoining near the Manchester. You're talking about an, a gargantuan pro, uh, issue, uh, I mean program. And so what Larry Laser is saying is that that can't happen and that by focusing on that, you're taking your eye off the ball of other things that have immediate priority. So he is both criticizing a high dream and the humdrum of daily congressional spending. Is this something that's palpable in the district, people maybe being not only tired of traffic issues, but maybe tired of not seeing as much action on this plan? Well, I think, I think what Dr. Laser was saying is that even in a year where we're spending so much money and there's so much fund, funding available for infrastructure, people really aren't even talking about the tunnel as, as being a viable <laughs> idea. I honestly haven't talked to that many people in West Hartford, and I talk to people in West Hartford all the time who who necessarily think, they definitely think something needs to change about the traffic going through Hartford, but not necessarily the tunnel being an idea that they want to actually live through the time that it would take to build the tunnel, plus that it really wasn't, isn't going to make that much of a, of a positive change. Highways, tunnels, and spending, uh, a big point uh, where the two candidates sparred. And in, in terms of spending, Social Security, uh, a big way that we uh, saw the two candidates come together tonight. I want to ask you first, Danny, when we're talking about Social Security and, and plans laid out tonight, do you think that Dr. Larry Laser was able to lay out a plan? Is that something you got tonight? No, he never laid out a specific plan, but what he said was we need to do it more intelligently than the John Larson, and John Larson is correctly credited with proposing the big Social Security 2100. He is a successor to his predecessor, Barbara Canelli, in the 80s and 90s, was a big Social Security advocate. I guess it goes with the Connecticut First District, I suppose. But he's opposing the, uh, he's saying that it's not paid for with the additional tax revenue. That's a, a matter of debate. These things are really, really hard to score, right? When you look and you say, is this paid for? It's, it's a dynamic model because it changes the whole economy. 
And he's also saying that ending benefits after four years is A, a non-starter, not intelligent to do, and B, not ever going to happen. The benefits will keep going up at a higher cost. Before I get your comment on this, Ronnie, I just want to say, let me, let, me, let me expand this further. We're talking about revamping uh, Social Security and plans to revamp Social Security uh, benefits for senior citizens by both Republican and Democrats. Uh, your comment on, on what Dan said, Ronnie. Oh, I actually have to agree completely with, with what Dan said. I, I can't say it any more intelligently. It is, um, Dr. Laser did not lay out a specific plan, but he said it's going to end up being too expensive. It's not going to be temporary, and then how are we going to pay for it? It's going to result in tax increases. This could be the last question that we had, but we saw fireworks throughout the night, of course, on Social Security, but, but more of like the first 15 minutes of the debate were supposed to be about abortion, but then it ended up being about Social Security and spending. And uh, it continued throughout as we got to the end and had a little bit of a discussion about crime. Uh, I'll start with you first, Ronnie. We're talking about Larry Laser, excuse me, Larry Laser talking about um, the police reform since George Floyd died and uh, defunding the police as he saw it, as he thinks the Demo Democrats are doing. How do you think he scored when he was talking there? Well, I think, I think his ide ideas are pretty mainstream and I think they're not um, conservative Republican. They, if he were to be elected and if he were to try to forward the ideas that he has, I think he'd, he'd run into opposition from the Republican Party, and I think that's, that's what he would be going up against. So I think maybe, while a lot of people in Connecticut might agree that those ideas make a lot of sense, and he, you know, the first thing he said when I met him was that he's pro-choice, and he's you know, in favor of, of um, uh, gun control, <coughs> but, but the problem is, is that he's not necessarily aligned with a lot of the people in the Republican Party today. Dan, just really quickly, I guess this was about crime. I, I thought the candidates were kind of all over the place in terms of the topics that we were talking about, but it seemed like Larson was getting into this about crime. Uh, he's associating Larry Laser with Republicans that stormed the Capitol on, or at least uh, Republican voters perhaps that stormed the Capitol on January 6th, or maybe extremist Republicans, whatever it is. Do you think he was able to, to land that, that punch there, or that jab that he was trying to make there and, and associate the two? In a general way, yes, because what he's saying is it doesn't make sense for the voters of the CT1 district to send someone to Congress in what could be uh, Kevin McCarthy's caucus if, he, if the Republicans win and he becomes the Speaker of the House. And so he's any, Democrat, any Republican in that caucus becomes a vote for that caucus. Even though Larry Laser, his argument is, I will be a voice of progressive thought within that caucus. That's the same thing we're seeing in the 5th District with uh, George Logan and, and Johanna Hayes. That's the same debate. The core issue here, the clash, is that the Democrats are saying any Republican is a Republican, and the Republicans are saying any Democrat is a Democrat spending too much money. We're going to have to leave it there. There's so much more to talk about, but only so limited time. And uh, this is not the last debate that we have. We have a debate coming up this Thursday night at 8 o'clock. It's in the 4th District. It's between Jamie Stevenson and Jim Himes. Thank you all so much for joining us on Connecticut Public tonight. For Ray Hardman, Ronnie Newton, and Dan Haar, I'm Frankie Graziano. Good night from Manchester.
Funding provided by the Connecticut Democracy Center, the Governor M. Jody Rell Center for Public Service at the University of Hartford, Travelers, and Yukon Health. Starting fall 2023, Connecticut will enter a new era in post-secondary education. With the launch of Connecticut State Community College, students will have the opportunity for a new educational experience delivered by the best community college system in the nation. CT State is a new way to educate Connecticut's residents. With hundreds of majors delivered on 12 campuses and online, CT State will not only meet Connecticut's workforce needs, but provide students with the career and life goal choices they need to be successful. We, we are CT State. State. 